Hello. Um, as Monty Python would say, and now for something completely different. So I'm here to talk about why the right kind of travel agent survival. That's what it was called when we first started. But I've changed this title because of, we were talking to a couple of you uh, earlier, and there's this perception that somehow, in fact, we talked about the last travel agent that survived it in the skit. Well, let me tell you, this speech is not about a bunch of people who survived and just are getting to the oasis. This is a speech and a presentation about why the right travel advisor has thrived. And make no mistake, they are thriving incredibly. So in fact, if you listen to a lot of what's been saying in the popular media, just our network alone has reached 19 billion consumer impressions this year. Well, quite frankly, my latest joke is, we're the hottest new thing that never went away. And it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. This, this group of people right here, by the way, if you have a mental image of what a travel agent looks like, this is an actual group of advisors in the Virtuoso Network. We do a, sh a photo shoot at the Bellagio every year. And if you look at these, this is a hip, incredible group of people with amazing expertise. Just to give you a little bit of a background of what, what has happened over the last 50 years, I wanted to do three short stories. And the first, I call back to the future because we kind of forget that back in the 1950s when travel was incredibly easy to book, right, and very, very simple, there actually were travel agents. And travel agents had a specific reputation of what they did, customer service, community knowledge, contacts, things that have never changed. But what happened was in 1976, Max Hopper and Bob Crandall decided to take the Sabre network, GDS, and came up with a really brilliant idea. Why don't we put the Sabre network inside travel agencies and let them actually do the processing? Well, what was the real reason for that? The real reason for that, it was a virtual technological version of moving your factory from the US to a low producing nation. It was about cheap labor because I could either hire more people to do reservations on this system, or I could put it out there and charge people for the set, pay them whatever commission I had at a much lower rate because I didn't have to have uh, pension plans or health insurance or anything like that. Basically, it was cheap labor. What it also did is it created a 20-year artificial monopoly on the content inside the reservation system. So you either had to go to the airline or you had to go to a travel agent. That meant that the number of travel agents expanded greatly. I mean, just exponentially, right? There were the travel advisors. But then, of course, after this 20-year kind of artificial monopoly, what ends up happening? Pressure for lowering costs. So in 1995, Delta Airlines began the commission cuts of travel agencies, right? Now, by the way, when I tell this part of the story, the agencies were also partially responsible for these commission cuts because the people who actually didn't do anything but process information and process tickets, they were just giving away their commission. So the airline said, well, if I'm gonna give you $100 and you're gonna give away 80, why am I paying you $100? So then began the, the shakeout in the agency business. So what could possibly be cheaper? If the res system was given to agents, to lower costs, what could possibly be cheaper? Well, let's go direct, the beginning of DIY. Let's have the consumer do the booking themselves for free. But also, there was a big company saying, you know what, we, went on the, we want in on this deal. And that's when Rich Barton went to Bill Gates and said, you know, we have this new thing called a GUI. It's called Windows. Let's show how you can actually take this new technology and make something that's very complicated on the back end very simple. And that was the birth of Expedia. That was the original reason why Expedia was born, right? So, and at that time, there was a generation that was going to be coming, a generation that had already changed multiple industries, a generation that had changed, for example, the stock brokerage business. And that was the baby boomer. In the late 1990s, everybody said, the baby boomer is coming, the internet's been invented, all this online booking is coming, you're toast. And so began the chorus of travel agents are dinosaurs, which we've been hearing for a long, long time. And everybody could see the writing on the wall. No more air commissions. So 
Would the airlines determine the future of the travel advisor? Well, yes and no. Yes, if you were a human APM, and no, if you were truly a trusted advisor. And that was because true travel advisors have never been just about the booking of travel. They have been, to put it in modern terms, they've always been about the user experience or the UX, right? So, let me tell you specifically why these advisors are thriving. First of all, and by the way, we'll talk a little bit more about technology later. First of all, they have succeeded individually. So I'll tell you first why they succeed individually, and then we'll talk about why they've succeeded collectively. First of all, to be a travel advisor today, it is not about that. It's about being a trusted advisor pre-trip, your contacts, your knowledge, your collaboration. It's about being of support to the customer during the trip, based on what you support and the, and the resources you have in the marketplace. But one of the most important things that makes a travel advisor a true travel advisor is the conversation after the trip. The difference between a transactional travel agent and a true trusted travel advisor is that conversation after the trip, meaning that they talk to the client, they say things like, if you could change anything about this trip, what it would be like, and there becomes a learning opportunity. That's one of those examples of, it's actually very simple, but simple doesn't mean easy. They also have clients who are loyal and not just repeat. Our own primary research has shown that loyalty is created on two fronts, the emotional and the structural. So from an emotional perspective, the reason advisors, great advisors have such great clients is because they deliver feeling experiences of security, of relaxation, of ease, of fun, inspiration. Great advisors, their clients, it, they, they go to them because they become their confidants. They become their savants. They, they, they're fun to deal with, and they're part of their lives. Structurally, as they deal with each other more and more, the more the advisor knows, the better the experiences, and, and vice versa for both. They're also brave enough to actually let go of clients who don't value them. I love that. Oh, it's you, not me, right? And they do that so that they can spend their time finding the ones that value their real expertise. Many, many of the great travel advisors today are amazing specialists, amazing experts in different destinations around the world. This is just one example of that recognition. Travel and Leisure, Condé Nast, Nat Geo, everybody. I mean, there's, everybody now has a list of travel specialists and travel advisors. Very well, great recognition for a group of people that really knows what they're talking about. They also know the difference between price and value. When I was on TV recently, the person, the anchor to my left said, but everybody knows you can go on the internet and find it cheaper and faster yourself. And that was on national TV. Now, it happened to be a business network. So I talked about, well, the best answer is what Warren Buffett says. Price is what you pay and value is what you get. One of the reasons that so many suppliers are spending time and energy building Top, uh, top supplier clubs and things like that is because these are the kinds of customers that they, that they have. They have customers that are value conscious, they want value, but it's not just about the price. So a good travel advisor understands the difference between price and value, they deliver it. And because they deliver that, they deliver some of the highest margin business to the suppliers in the world. They also wouldn't have gotten there if they hadn't embraced technology that enhances the human touch. From the telex machine to the fax machine to the computers to mobility, travel advisors have embraced technology. We have a new Virtuoso incubator program. There's a lot of exciting new technologies that are creating hybrids between the high touch and the, and the technological touch that's out there. That touch is also enhanced by their continuous investment in relationships. You know, it's that old thing that mom and dad taught you, right? It's not just what you know, it's who you know. And the reality is, is that the customers of these advisors actually understand when they come back from all over the world that the relationships and the connections that their advisor has with the people that they're sending them, whether it's a GM of a hotel, a ground operator in, in Africa, wherever it may be, those relationships actually make a difference in the way the client experiences the travel. I call it very simply, you can't take the human out of humanity. So frankly, I've been around these people my entire life, just about, and, 
as Aretha Franklin would say, I get really upset when I hear these things about travel agents because these people deserve R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect. These are some of the most incredible professionals in our industry. And you know what's funny? I put this picture up. These are some of our, our, our amazing people. Every single person here has been in business for over 30 years. They are still going strong. I can't name you a list of travel industry executives who made fun of these people who are no longer in the business and they're still going strong. We have a lady who just retired literally about four or five years ago, Miriam Rand. She's about to turn 100. She was Marilyn Monroe's uh, Bing Crosby's travel agent. And it was amazing. When I sold my travel agency, this guy says, oh, you got to get, you know, these people are going to be dead or retired. You need to come with us because we're going to take over the world. Guess what? She outlasted them by 20 years, right? So I was lucky enough to learn this through personal experience. I grew up as a tour operator. In fact, I knew Jeffrey Kent when I was a very small kid. I grew up as a tour operator. When I was 23, and I've said this publicly before, if somebody would have told me when I was 23 that I'd spend the next 30 years of my life hanging out with travel agents, I'd probably shot myself. And I've said it publicly, right? But the reality was is because there were the real travel advisors and then there were the people that were just kind of like there, right? So I got to learn that. I, I called on travel agents. Then I started a travel agency and realized how difficult that business really was. And then also a DMC. I got the opportunity when I was in my 20s to be on multiple sides of the fence. And you know, we heard with the first speaker today about empathy. People asked me how the Virtuoso Network was born. It was actually partially born out of empathy. It's so easy to sit on this side of the fence, point the finger at the other person and say, if you just get your act together, uh, we would do better, a better, better business until you get on the other side of the fence. Those were the seeds of what is Virtuoso today. So now let me tell you why travel advisors have also succeeded because of their willingness to collaborate. So today we think about things like crowdfunding, whatever. Our organization was founded by a group of travel agencies in 1950. We talk today about things like crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. These people were doing it in 1950. They opened up an office in midtown Manhattan, hired a bunch of European expats, and created a shared operations center so that they could create amazing bespoke travel experiences. They shared telex machines. They shared bank accounts. They shared contracts. So this was the original. So because of that kind of just DNA of collaboration, right? When we took it over, technology was changing, things were happening, but we felt we could overcome. We, we saw the baby boomer coming, we saw the next generations, we saw that travel was gonna really go on the rise and we thought there was a great opportunity. So together we realized that there were two things we felt we could overcome. Number one, nobody gives better client care than these people to their clients, right? So from a customer perspective, they were the best. But what they were up against in the late 80s and then into the 90s and so on was competing against scale. So the other problem that we had was the problem of the lowest common denominator, that all travel agents were painted with the same brush, right? People were just saying, oh, travel agents, as if they were all the same. So we embraced the concept of competition because they're all independent businesses. And we did it with this definition, my favorite definition of leadership. Setting aside some small amount of self-interest in order to accomplish something together that we could not do alone. So let's review some examples of how we did that. Product curation, buying power. Our network alone is now $15 billion. The way we, we share information, the way we curate suppliers is something we do together. We also started playing with big data back in the 80s. Literally, big data for us started when travel agents sent us their 20-year-old Rolodex in a shoebox and we entered it into a database. That has now come, become a $40 billion data warehouse. The advantage travel agents and travel advisors have is they have data across the entire specter of all their cu customers' purchases. That also led to collective content marketing at scale taking the product and putting it in, in, tremendous, uh, in tremendous content, talking about not just the product, but the entire destination, how to do it better, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of our additions of how to travel better. And speaking of scale, they also scaled human connection. One of the things that we spend, that travel advisors spend a lot of time on is building those relationships. These are the number of appointments that just our network alone does at the Bellagio every year. 451,000 appointments in five days from 5,000 people from 90 countries. 
so that you can say to your customer, I've met with this person in Istanbul, I know this person in Bhutan, and so on and so forth. Also, they started, you know, we talk about the sharing economy. Who had ever heard of a bunch of independent entrepreneurs saying, let's create a product for a particular customer set, in this case, cruisers, where we will host each other. So I'll host your clients, you host my clients. You know, in an era of competition where everybody can call anybody else, they created an entire product category by being willing to share each other's clients and look after them. They also engage their clients in telling their story. We were talking about that earlier. And their clients have given us amazing content, whether it's our reviews and recommendations, whether it's the photography, whether it's why we travel and why they love their advisor. But most importantly, they also focused on the single point of failure. 10 years, 14 years ago, we changed our mission statement because we knew that the single point of failure was if we weren't gonna have the travel advisors of the future. So we all focused on this, how do we make this profession? These are, these are uh, pictures of some of our new young entrants, whether they're career switchers. The gentleman on the, on, on the, uh, on the left here was an attorney who joined the profession, closed his, his attorney. I, by the way, I can't even keep track of all the attorneys that have quit the law now. Uh, one, of our, one of our attorney advisors actually has on her, on her profile at the end what she describes herself, and I'm so glad to be a travel advisor today because I'm also a recovering attorney. So these are amazing people. This profession has become a hot profession. So where is it all going? Let's just see. Our new app will revolutionize car service and repair. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, is that anything like uh, cars.com's new feature called service and repair? No, because with ours, you'll know the cost of labor and parts in your area. Anywhere, like, anyone else? Like cars.com? So you'll never pay more than you should. Like cars.com. Excuse me one second. She's totally right. I messed up. I'm sorry. Cancel the IPO. Okay. I, I, when I saw that watching college football, I thought, that's just too good to pass up, right? But the reason I do that is because I think one of the things that happens sometimes when we, when we talk about the future is that we get a little narrow thinking, I'm not here to tell you that what, what, what I'm saying is the future. What I'm saying is there is a bright future for this particular profession and this channel, if you want to call it that, right? So let's put it in terms of skift. Here's a skift take. Ubiquity of information means everyone's an expert, thus the need for deeper connection beyond digital. Well, first of all, the word information. Travel advisors haven't been in the information business for a decade. They're not in the information business. They're in the clarity business. They're in the service business. They're making it simpler for people. They're processing, they're collaborating. And the really cool thing about it is that digital has actually made the profession of travel advisor actually a deeper, more personal, and more persistent relationship than, than they could ever have done before because of mobility and because of social media. The profession has changed when it used to be you were hired, put in a cubicle, and you were lucky to maybe take a trip or whatever. Today, the new travel advisors of today are traveling the world, they're, they're, they're dealing with their clients 24 seven all over the world, and they're social media savvy. So we think about all these apps, but we forget about these two huge trends of mobility and social media as having been something that affected it. Travel desires are, as they said, right in the strength of advisors. Travelers want deeper experiences, inspiration, personalization, self-discovery. These are all extremely deep human traits. And as, as we saw earlier, contrast that with the desires of the commodity focus of optimization. Every single brand in the world has only one overarching problem left. All the others are subsets of that. How not to be commoditized. And if you've never read Simon Sinek's, one of the most viewed TED speakers ever, the book and watched his, his speech, Start With Why, I really recommend it. People buy the why and they commoditize the what. And we believe that the more tech is used, right, the more craving there is for human connection. In fact, Brene Brown, another amazing TED speaker, has talked about that connection. When we hired her as a keynote speaker, speaker she said, well, people were asking, why would you bring a, a, a psychologist and social work person to come speak to a bunch of travel people? Because it was about the human connection. Advisors are also successful because they already naturally focus on clients' lives and not the individual booking. Travel brands reimagine themselves as lifestyle connoisseurs. Well, 
advisors have been doing that organically for a long time. And now they're merchandising it within our network. We call it being in the return on life business, helping you plan a lifetime of extraordinary trips. So let's look at, an, if you want to understand how we've kind of morphed, look at what's happened in another industry. We have a partnership with Merrill Lynch now because Merrill Lynch has realized that the job of a wealth advisor is not to help you die with the most money. The job of a wealth advisor is to help you have a strategy to have the finances to help you with the priorities of life, right? Family, health, giving. And so our relationship with them is, why would you have a wealth advisor in your life to help you manage your financial assets? but not have somebody in your life to help you optimize your most valuable non-renewable asset, your free leisure time, right? So amazing relationship because they're not introducing our advisors to their clients as another, here, here are people to book your travel. They're introducing us as here are advisors to help us do for you, for your leisure time and your experiences, what we do for your money. So we definitely agree that travel innovation is not just tech and while we love tech, and there's a lot of really cool stuff coming our way. We believe that to reignite innovation and passion, you have to rehumanize work. Think about all the things we've heard today about passion, about personalization, authenticity. That's all a human connection trait. And that passion is coming from a stealth growth you probably had not heard of. 10% growth in the number of, of full-time US travel advisors, but also 434% growth in independent travel advisors. This is something you don't hear a lot about because it just doesn't get reported on. So this growth actually makes the hottest new thing that's coming your way because ladies and gentlemen, what we know matters, but who we are matters more. Thank you.